Well, listen, we're going to get back in our study, and this is kind of where we've been. Uh, we've been in the book of Acts for a while, after a couple of years of just being in the Gospels, looking at the good news of Jesus Christ, learning how to be like Jesus, learning how to disciple others like Jesus, how to grow and continue to shape in that way, and then we went into Acts on how we do that, as he calls us to lead people to Jesus, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, and to disciple each other. And then he calls us to do that in particular areas. If you remember, he talked about uh, going to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the ends of the earth, which as they would hear that, to your hometown, to your country, the people are different than you because there's no room for prejudice within the body of Christ, and to all the ends of the earth. So we really wanted to go through Acts and see how the early church did that, how the heroes of our faith did that, and what lessons we can learn as we're called to do that as well. Because again, if you've accepted Jesus as leader and forgiven your life, by acknowledging with your mouth he's the Son of God, believing your heart he died and rose again, so you're giving him lordship and you're accepting his forgiveness, and then you are saved and we automatically also become ministers to be able to lead others. So that's been the whole goal of this. And we've been through a lot of Acts so far. Um, actually, we're up to chapter 21. If you want to get your Bibles out, we'll turn there. Acts 21. And... Um, we are building on where we've been. So we really have seen all the different areas that we've looked at. And then now we're looking a little bit more into the world end of things. Last week, we dove into Paul and the Church of Ephesus. And we went through a few chapters of that. There was a lot of material in one day, but it was an incredible testimony and a lot of things that we can learn on how we can teach others and how we can be taught and looking for new areas that we can grow in. And then... If you remember, at the end, he called all the elders to him of Ephesus and said, I love my time with you. I love you guys, but I'm, it's time to move on. The Holy Spirit's telling me to move on. Matter of fact, when the Spirit says it's time to move on, it was not just time to go someplace else. It was um, a heavy news. If you remember in chapter 20, in verse 22 and 23, uh, Paul told them, Now, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me, or promises to me, that in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. So not necessarily the best news. It's going to be a hard road. It's going to be a tough road. And so we're going to pick up and look at that road. Again, if you don't have a Bible, there's Bibles in your chairs underneath your seats uh, and baskets. If you need a Bible, we'll keep one. And then also version is up and running if you use that app that has live events, so that we have a live event there. But we're going to cover this road, and it's going to start, again, chapter 21, um, and I think we're going to hit 22, 23, and 24, and 25, and 26, and 27, and 28. Sister, kick your shoes off. Okay. <laughs> we are going to cover seven chapters today, believe it or not. Um, so when I joked about when I was on vacation, that uh, everybody kept letting me out too early, I banked my time. No, it really won't take much more time, but it's going to be a similar format to last, uh, last week, where I want to get the, the testimony on the table of this hard road that he had to walk to go to Rome and the hard things that he had to go through. So we have that in front of us. And then we're going to look at some points of what we can learn and what we can take from that when it comes to the hard roads that we go through. Does that make sense? And so just to make you feel even better about going through eight, eight chapters, you know how like Chuck and I talked about like pastors, you're supposed to have three points at the end? And then you guys like roll your eyes when I do like five or nine. <laughs> Today we have 14. Okay, so <laughs> starting out, uh, let's see, I'm going to make sure I get to the very beginning here. Back to 21. I mean, my silliness is taking me off track. So he has been promised a hard road, and 21 is what starts it out there. So let me... Uh, Read again. I, I love when we can read. I know sometimes it's easy to glaze over. We should not when it comes to Scripture, so we'll get some practice. But you're also going to have to listen to me do some storytelling as we go. Chapter 21, verse 1. And when he or we had parted from them. Now, just a side note. This is kind of cool. Who writes Acts? Does anybody remember? Luke. Luke. Luke is writing the story of the early church. And Luke is a, a physician. Uh, and I'm not going to go into all this because it's outside the scope. But that, at that time, that also means he was probably a servant or a slave um, who has been trained to be a doctor for his master. And there is a belief, not 100%, okay, 
that there's a belief that he was gifted in his freedom to Paul from a family member. And so Luke is on his mission trips with him. So when we hit we, we have moved from when he's taken and writing down other people's testimonies to giving his own too. So Luke is more than likely part of this we. When we had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kaz, and then the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera. And having found a ship crossing to Fasonia, we went aboard and we set sail. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and then landed at Tyre, for there the ship was going to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples in that area, we stayed there for seven days, okay, so a week. And through, through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When our days ended, there were, I'm sorry, when our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey, and all, everyone with their wives and children accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Petonium, okay, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Syria, and we entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who is one of the seven. When he says one of the seven, if you remember when we first got into this, there's the seven that were originally the original disciples uh, that were taking care of people's needs, widows of need. Stephen was one of his buddies, the one, the first one was martyred <laughs> for the faith, but Think about this, just as you're, you're, you're keeping your, um, your, your educated biblical imagination of this. Philip is welcoming in Paul, who was Saul, who gave authority over his best friend's death. That's the power of Christ's forgiveness. Okay, so Paul came and he's staying with Philip, one of the seven, and, and then uh, verse 9 says that he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were staying for many days, a prophet, named Ag a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and bound his own hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt, Paul. And they will deliver him to the hands of the Gentiles, Rome. When we heard this, we and all the people then urged him, Do not go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, Let the will of the Lord be done. So two different times there's confirmation from the Holy Spirit, Yes, this is going to be a hard road. Both times, well-meaning people, brothers and sisters of Christ, are saying, You can avoid this. We don't want you to have to go through this. But Paul is continually leaning in too what the Spirit first told him, you are constrained to go this path because it's God's will. This reminds me, um, I, I put on Facebook this week, Jenny and I went to see uh, Bonhoeffer Friday night. And Bonhoeffer, I'm telling you, the first 20 minutes is slow. It's not like a fun, hey, let's go get a romantic comedy type movie. Uh, it is the biography of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a great theologian in the 30s and 40s uh, in Germany, very young for, for that stature. And he was there during the rise of Hitler, and he spoke against what they were seeing as far as the hatred towards the Jews and the, the rise as Hitler continued to have more power. Um, once Hitler got into power, he continued to speak out. He took a target, big target on his chest, went through horrible things, and ultimately was martyred for his faith. Uh, and he had a chance as well to step out of it. But no, I'm prepared to give everything, and this is the Spirit's will, and there's a purpose behind this is what we see there and we see in Paul's life here in this moment. Uh, as you continue through this, you're going to see that he does go to Jerusalem, like he says he's going to. He visits James there, the half-brother of Jesus. Again, James wasn't a believer in Jesus until after the resurrection, when we see that Jesus appeared to him. Uh, he is reporting to them everything that's going on with the Gentiles. We've seen this a few times as we go through Acts, because there's so much rift between Jewish people who believe they're God's chosen people and Gentiles that Jesus has opened the door to through the fulfillment, and they're still trying to get their heads around that. So there's still a lot of prejudice and challenges, and Paul's been working with the Gentiles, even though he's Jewish himself. So he goes back and he tells them all the good things that are happening. They're celebrating. They're excited, except they say, Paul, there is a problem. There's some rumors, and there's some things that people are saying. that these Jews from Asia that came down, and they're telling everybody that you're telling everybody to forget Moses. 
They're telling everybody to forget the law. They're, they're, they're telling you that they, you're completely talking against the Jewish faith, and they, they are coming for you. Now, that's a very thin line between the fulfillment of the law and the abandonment of the law, where, where Paul was teaching about the fulfillment. So they say, here's what we want you to do. We suggest you go with these four guys, you go into the synagogue, and you have a purification ritual. That is, that is required by the law in the season that he was in. And you, so he goes, and he does the four days, he, does, he shaves his head, um, and he does the purification ritual. That might sound like they're trying to play the Jewish game, and they're trying to compromise their faith, but it's not. And I'm going to kind of show that out to you in the, as they go, what that purpose was as we dig into this. But for now, that's what happens. And then we see that they're still not satisfied in verse, uh, let's say, 27 or 21. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stood up the whole crowd and laid hands on Paul. That's not like they're praying over him. That's like they're beating him, okay? And they're crying out, and he, and they're crying out men of Israel, help. This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law in this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophy, the Ephesian, with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. So he didn't bring him in the temple. They just added that into the gossip. They just assumed it. Then all the city was stirred up and the people ran together. They seized Paul and they dragged him out of the temple and once at the gates were shut. Uh, and as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. So he at once took his soldiers, okay, so these are the gent Gentiles, these are the Romans, they, they took his soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. So this is like the kids beating up their little brother and the parents walked in the room. Okay, they have permission to do whatever they want, but the soldiers come in, they stop beating him. Then the tribune, verse 33, came up and arrested Paul and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He knows nothing about the situation, but where the smoke is fire, right? So he arrested him. Two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. Some of the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. So Paul's pretty beaten up at this point. For the mob of the people who followed them, crying out, away with him. Now, the next part here, I think, for some reason, I, I just smile a little bit. I don't know if I find it amusing, if I find it brave, if I, whatever, whatever it is. But as they're dragging Paul, they're carrying Paul in, and he's beaten, and all this is going on, and there's this riot going on, Paul looks to the tribune and says, may I say something to you? And I don't think he had much of a voice, but that's just a weird way. That, that, that shows he respects his authority. It shows that he's polite. He's not this out, uh, crazed madman that they thought they were, but may I say something to you? And so he says, yes. He says, I'm a Jew. And the, and the tribune is completely confused because he had heard other things about this guy, and he's like, wait, you're one of them? I, I'm completely confused on what's going on in this, this point. So he lets him speak to the crowd. And Paul starts speaking in Hebrew, their native language. And so the people are confused, and they shut up, and there's a hush over them. And Paul, in his beaten state, blood running down his face, bruises galore, so galore, stands in front of them and says, let me tell you my testimony of how good God is. And for a multiple amount of times that we have it, he tells them about, I used to be a persecutor against, the, against Christ in the way. I used to arrest people. I used to kill people because of the faith. And then I met Jesus, and this is the difference that he made in my life again, right? But God, the, the, this is the difference that he, that he made, and this is the, the, the difference he can make in your life as well. That takes us up to chapter 22, verse 22. Up to this word, the entire time he's showing his testimony, up to this word, they listened to him. Then, when he says, this is verse 21, go, for I will send you, that God told him, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. They stopped being quiet, and they started screaming again, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. In other words, killing. Just because he was talking about taking the Gentiles, not just the Jews. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and the fleeing of dust in the air, the tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks, saying that he should be examined by flogging. In other words, he should be beat. Uh, to find out why they were shouting against him like this. But when they had stretched him out on, for the whips, 
Paul said to the centurion who was standing beside him, Is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? It's not. So again, it's kind of like that, may I say something to you? Was, he, he just, in the middle of being stretched out and getting ready to be beaten, his clothes were ripped off him, he's like, hey, just a quick question, point of order, is it legal for you to do this to a woman? He hasn't been charged. And look at the response, 26, when the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, what are you about to do? This man's a Roman citizen. So the tribune came and said to Paul, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, yes. Tribune answered, look, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. Or was he wasn't Roman, he bought that right to be a Roman. Paul said, but I am a citizen by birth. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately, and the tribune also was afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen, and they had bound him, which is a death sentence. Because Paul has certain rights because of his birthright as a Roman. So... With this, they now take and try to get it off their lap. They send him over to the council, so now he's in front of the Jews again. Uh, they beat him some more. They're hitting him in the mouth. Um, he sees that the, it's getting worked up more and more with the council. And Paul, who, again, I love his strategy, uh, as he just leads in the spirit, um, he looks around in the middle of all this beating and screaming and realizes half of them are Pharisees and half of them are Sadducees. Okay, these religious leaders. There's a difference between the Pharisees and Sadducees. They're all godly. They're all Jewish. But Pharisees, the, the one that's most known is they believe in an afterlife. They believe in angels. They believe in, in, in everything from a spiritual standpoint. Sadducees don't. They don't believe in anything afterlife. And so in the middle of all this, he cries out. This is down in verse 6 of 23. Brothers, I'm a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And do you know what happened in that moment? They forgot about Paul. Because the Pharisees said, huh. And the Sadducees said, there's no such thing as an afterlife. And the Pharisees said, yes, there is. And they said, no, you're stupid. And so they got into a fight amongst themselves over the afterlife and forgot about Paul. But he was being trampled because there was a physical fight between them. And so they end up pulling him out so he has saved his life in that particular moment. So there's a media fight. It's really intense. They pull him out. Uh, if we get to 2311, it says, The following night, in the midst of all this heaviness and this hard road, the Lord stood by, by Paul and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. Take another look there. Make sure you don't miss it. It wasn't an angel that came to him. Do you see that? It was Jesus. It's capital L. It's Jesus. You've testified about me, and now you must testify about me in front of Caesar. It's Jesus. Comes and appears to him to comfort him during this time. That's how bad the road is. So, as you get in the, in the 12, there's now comes forward a, a plan to kill Paul. Uh, gosh, I got such a weird sense of humor. Forty guys decide they're going to kill Paul. And they make a vow that they will not eat or drink again until they kill Paul. Okay, keep that in mind. So they go to the council and say, look, you guys don't want him. We don't want him. You can't touch him. But if you set up a trial against him and bring him here, we'll ambush them on the road and we'll kill him for you and it's all done. And the council says, that sounds good to us. Right? Then the word gets out a little bit. And guess who finds out a little about the plan? Paul's sister's son, his nephew. He comes to Paul and says, I heard news. And Paul goes, go tell that tribune guy that I freaked out the other day. Go tell him. And so the tribune, now either because he's been impacted or because he's afraid of Rome and this whole situation's a mess, he takes and puts together 200 spearsmen, 200 soldiers, and 70 horsemen. And he gets an extra horse for Paul. And he says, these 470 people are going to take you to Caesarea because I don't want this in my town anymore. And so they move forward. So they don't get a chance to kill Paul. And I'm guessing within three days, those guys are pretty hungry and thirsty. You, you, you with me? My guess is they probably broke the vow because they don't seem to be all that serious about it anyways. So he's taken to Caesarea. That's going to get us up to chapter 24. Ha ha, we're picking up pace. Picking up pace. Through this time, like 23 and 24, he's now in front of the uh, Roman, uh, let's call him governor. I might be using the wrong term there, but uh, Felix, he's over this area. Uh, the charges come to him, uh, and it's a 
painful situation he doesn't want to deal with. You could read all that at home later, make sure I'm not making stuff up for you. But when he comes before Felix, um, there ends up uh, just being something he doesn't want to really have to deal with. We'll, we'll pick it up in 2410 um, and see where we go there. So when the governor, this is Felix, had nodded to, to Paul to speak, he says, knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify that it is not more than two, 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. So this is a very short amount of time. And they did not find me disputing with anybody or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down in the law and written by the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, we're all on the same page, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience. You see that? I always take pains to have a clear conscience, both before God and man. I want to be above reproach so that nothing gets in the way of the gospel message. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms to the nation and to present offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd of tumult. Now do you see why the, the apostles told him to do it? So to be above reproach, so that would not be an issue. So he says, I'm, I'm right in line, but some of the Jews from Asia, they ought to be here before you, and they ought to be the ones making the accusation so they have anything against me. Or else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council, other than this one thing. Again, I find this funny. Uh, I cried out while standing among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial before you today. I've done nothing wrong. I'm above reproach. I'll tell you this one little thing. Yeah, I did kind of cause a riot. I'm sorry about that. I kind of knew what I was doing. So he, did, he, does, he does call that out. So again, Felix doesn't know what to do. So Felix, in his infinite wisdom, decides, I'm not going to deal with it. There's another governor coming in two years. We'll just wait till he gets here, and he can, it can be his problem. And then he ends up meeting with Paul several times over, trying to uh, actually get a bribe. Paul meets with him, testifies to him, witnesses to him. But Felix, he was kind of hoping to get a bribe, and it never really worked out. So now Festus. I love the name Festus. It reminds me, my dad and I watched like Gunsmoke and different shows with each other. It just kind of reminds me of that, you know, like Festus. So good old Festus comes into town. In verse 1 of 25, it says, Now three days after Festus has arrived in the province, he went to Jerusalem from Caesarea. And the chief priest and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case before, against Paul, and they urged him, asking him as a favor against Paul, that he summoned him to Jerusalem, because they were planning an ambush to kill him on the way. But two years later, they're just going with the exact same thing. Festus replied that Paul was being kept at Syria and that he himself intended to go there. So he said, let the men of authority among you go down with me, and if there's anything wrong about this man, let them bring charges against him. Okay, so this is the beginning for, for Festus. After he stayed among them not more than eight or ten days, he went out to Caesarea. And the next day he took a seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. When he arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood among him, bringing many of the serious charges against Paul that could not be proved. So Paul argued in his defense, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I committed any offense. But Festus, wishing to do Jews a favor, said to Paul, don't you wish to go to Jerusalem and there be tried on the charges before me? Festus is just the new guy trying to get the Jews on his side. It's basically what it is. And so he doesn't want to order Paul to go with them because that'd be bad PR. But if Paul agrees... Then, the, then he get the credit from, the, from them. But Paul, verse 10, said, I'm standing before Caesar's tribunal. Well, I ought to be, because he's Roman. To the Jews, I have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. If then I'm a wrongdoer and I have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there's nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them. So I appeal to Caesar. I appeal to Caesar is the same thing if you're watching uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. A little ginger reference there. And they say, Paul Lay. You remember that? It means you can't touch me until I talk to the captain. That's basically what this is. You can't touch me until I go to Caesar. I'm a Roman citizen. So Festus, when he conferred with his council, said to Caesar, you have appealed. To Caesar, you should go. So he's there. He's meet, meet with them a little bit. There's a whole section here about King Agrippa that you can read later as well in 25. Uh, king Agrippa is a Jewish uh, king. 
the last Jewish king, if I remember correctly, and he comes to meet Paul, uh, and the, he, he, again, is being testified to, and Paul enjoys that opportunity. And, uh, and then verse 2 of chapter 26, uh, Paul says this, I consider myself fortunate, that is, before you, King Agrippa, that I'm going to make my defense today because of these accusations due, because you're familiar with the customs, you're familiar with the controversies, therefore I beg you to, to listen to me patiently. So he does. And then when he gets to the end of it, verse 30, the king rises, and the governor and Bernice and all that were sitting with him. And when they were drawn in the back, in the back hallway, they said to one another, this man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa, the king says to Festus, this man could have been set free if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. I would have set him free. Did Paul make a stupid mistake? Or was this part of God's plan? So, he gets set to Rome. We're going to go through 27. Uh, you're going to see a lot there about his transportation, uh, some challenges they had with the seasons, uh, and then a storm comes up because of the mistakes they make with the seasons. And everybody thinks they're going to drown. These are prisoners. These are guards. This is Paul. And in verse 22 of 27, Paul is speaking to the guys during this, this ship catastrophe. And he says, uh, I urge you to take heart. You know, just imagine everything's falling apart. I urge you to take heart. For there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood beside me an angel of God, to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid. Paul, you must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all that you sell with you. So take heart, for I have faith in God that I will, it will be exactly as I've been told. But we must run aground on some island. So he's, he's trying to cheer everybody up. He's telling people he's been re reassured. They have a wreck. They end up wrecking on an island called Malta. Uh, the, the guards decide they're going to kill all the prisoners because they're afraid they're going to run away and escape. Uh, God changes that plan because he promised that everybody was going to be okay. And so none of the prisoners are hurt. The people of the island are very nice and they're very accommodating and they are very friendly and so they help them out. The only thing that's kind of in here, and you, you, you might want to read it later, um, but you might have heard of it already. There's a, a place on Malta where Paul is making a campfire while they're waiting to be rescued. Uh, and he's getting the wood together and he gets uh, bitten by a snake. Does anybody remember that story? Yeah, this is where that happens. So he gets bitten by a snake, a venomous snake, and everybody there says, oh, this guy's full of a bunch of crap because God wouldn't let that happen to a godly man, so he must be a sinner. And then nothing happened. He didn't get bruised, he didn't get tingling, nothing. And then all of a sudden, oh, he must be a god. <laughs> so a lot of circumstantial stuff that they're following on these things. Convinced him not God, but he is doing ministry with them. To chapter 28. Rome. In chapter 28, Paul arrives in Rome. He's under house arrest. The community is called together, the community of believers. He's encouraged and greatly encouraged, I believe is how it's, it's phrased, that um, the community has come to him. And then it says in verse 23 or 28, I told you it wouldn't take all day. It feels like smoking the bandit, doesn't it? We've got a long way to go, a short time to get there. Luis, bound to watch old bandit run. Is it just my generation and older? Oh, the kids are looking at me like, it's go watch Smokey and the Bandit. It's a good movie. Jerry Reed's awesome. So it's uh, Boat Reynolds or whatever. Anyways, verse 23. They appointed a day for Paul, and they came to him in his lodging in greater numbers. And these are, these are the leaders, the Jewish leaders in this area. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, and others disbelieved. And disagreeing amongst themselves, they departed after Paul, and he made this statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet. So he's about to quote scripture from the Old Testament. It's been around for a long, long time. They all know it. Go to this people and say, you will indeed hear, but never understand. This is what they're doing. You will indeed see, but you will not perceive. From this people's heart has grown dull, in their ears they can barely hear, in their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles will listen. He lived there two whole years at his own expense, and this is house arrest. 
and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance, the end. What a horrible ending. Have you ever seen a movie that you, you, you thought was a one-parter and ends up being a two-parter and you're then like, what? You know what I'm talking about? Like, like tonight, we're, we're going to see, I don't, I don't know what your opinion is of musicals and all that kind of stuff, but we're going to go, go see Wicked. Uh, we, we like that. It's based off The Wizard of Oz. And uh, I just noticed two days ago that it's part one. And if I didn't know that before tonight, I would have been thrown down. I would have been thrown down because it just seems so incomplete. And that's kind of what Luke does here. This is what you need to know to be able as the church to take this forward to your hometown, to your country, to people that are different than you, and to all the ends of the world. Church history gives us more. Again, for two years he was under house arrest, and then he was acquitted. This would have been about 61 A.D. Uh, from there he went on his third mission trip, continued doing the work of the Lord until he was arrested again in 67 A.D. So he had about six years between those two points and was brought back to Rome. In 68 uh, A.D., uh, the emperor Nero uh, had a mass execution of Christians. And this is when, more than likely, Paul was beheaded and died in Rome, never really being able to do what he thought he wanted to do, but doing what God wanted him to do. And this testimony lives on. Okay, everybody got the story? So I can repeat it. Nobody? Okay. So as I said, 14 points. Now, normally, I would condense these down into like group categories and try to make it smaller, bite-sized for our note-takers, those type of things. Uh, for the first time ever, I felt compelled not to do that. That's why there's 14. We're just going to go through them. Because I'm pretty sure, I just feel confident, the Holy Spirit has something for in, different people, different ways on this one. Um, I mean, he always does. But, so I'm just going to put it all out there. And we're just going to kind of zoom through them. If you are a note taker and I'm going faster than you want, feel free to take pictures of the screen or talk to me afterwards and I'll send you screenshots of the screen so what those points are because I know that can be annoying for some. Um, and we'll just see what the Spirit says to you. Does that sound good? I'm just going to explain what I see there, what can encourage us, what we can learn from, what type of things we can adopt, and just go from there on what God has. Ready? Screen one. So I'll towards the beginning. We learn that you can lean into or away from God's will. Only one really works out, but you can do one or the other. Paul had a choice. He either was constrained by the Spirit to go to Caesar to take the road, or as other people who were well-meaning, strong Christians, awesome people who loved him, were trying to talk him out of it. You always have the choice between one or the other. When I went into full-time ministry and had to quit my full-time work in my late 20s, early 30s, uh, when God put on my heart, look, you know you have a call in your life, you can keep doing it your way or my way. And that was a big sacrifice to get from one to the other. The only thing I knew at 30, because I was pretty stupid at 30, not that I'm much more at 56, but I was pretty stupid at 30, I knew that God's way was going to be better. And it was. And it was. So you have that option. Falsehoods will be spoken against you. If you're following the Lord and His will of what He's leaning to, you're going to get some gossip. You're going to get some backstabbing. You're going to get people taking half-truths, saying, I bet you that He took that Gentile into the synagogue like He wasn't supposed to. I just know it. No, you don't. You're wrong. Those things are going to come up. Don't be surprised by that. As part of us having an integrity that's above reproach. Falsehoods, let's see, got that? You will take hits. People are gossiping and backstabbing. Trust me, you want to take some hits, you're going to lose some friends or people that you thought were friends. And you have to be prepared to give a proper defense when people come against you. Because that's just how Satan works. That's um, one of my favorite things about Paul. Is he, he says in several different areas, um, it, it's by his integrity that he stands. I need to be above reproach before God. What matters is I'm above reproach. If, I am in, if God's happy with me, then I did not lie against you. I just know that. You might believe me, you might not, but our goal is our Father, and that I'll witness thereafter. And I'm telling you, you witness if it's legit. Not that we don't make mistakes, because trust me, I make mistakes, but if you go back, you apologize for it, you keep going forward, and that's your part of your integrity as well, it does work. God will have you back. Next. See, these points aren't too bad. 
Let your integrity be a witness. Let us cover that. Tom, stop getting ahead of yourself. Next, know your citizenship rights. This might be an odd one, but Paul knew what his citizenship rights were, and he used it for the kingdom. Anything that we have that God has entrusted to us is to be leveraged for, for the kingdom, not myself. So, in his case, it was his Roman citizenship or that he was a Jew. Uh, there was times I've been working in a church environment or as an associate pastor of a youth group, and it was a church that didn't really care that much about youth and had a lot of opinions on what youth should do and not do, uh, and that could cause headaches sometimes. But I knew their church constitution better than they did, frontwards and backwards. So that there was times like, kids can't come into this business meeting and vote when they're only 13 years old. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I must have misread the constitution that you guys worship so deeply, because according to that, anybody who's a member can vote, and the only thing that kids can't vote on is when they're 12 and younger on buying property. Oh, know your rights. Know, know what you're doing, because we were trying to teach the kids how to be good members of the, of the church. Um, lean into God's plans instead of man's man plans, which is obviously Paul did here as well. Use man's schemes for the kingdom. When Felix was trying to get a bribe, he got witness to over and over and over again. Doesn't seem like it's free will that he chose it. But if somebody's coming up against you and you know they're setting you up, man, it might be time to be a little crafty. It might be a way to show him Jesus. Have a different view than the world. Have a different view than the world, which we see within this testimony over and over again. Um, Paul is very, very different, including against Luke himself. Next, trust God's word. Wouldn't it be nice if Jesus showed up at your house tonight and told you what's going on? Yeah. That'd be nice. Or an angel show up and tell you, hey, just to let you know for the next six months, you're completely fine. That'd be nice to have. That's what this is. That's what this is. This is God's word expressed. Lean on his word. Know his word. It's amazing how many people think they know what's in the Bible and they're completely wrong. Don't judge by circumstances <coughs> alone. That's going back to that snake bite. We do this as Christians a lot. I think God wants me to take this job because it makes more money. Maybe. Maybe Satan's still offering you more money because he wants to put you in a bad place and six months they lay you off and then you have nothing. Don't just go by circumstances. Community makes a difference. That's huge. Christian community is part of being in the family of Christ. We are not adopted into the family of Christ to be the orphan still or to be alone. This, this is the, it's not about Sunday morning church. It's about community. Ministry is not always easy, but faithfulness leads to fruitfulness. Write that one down, get it all tattooed, whatever it takes. Put it on your mirror at home with a dry erase marker. Take it, put it on a post note and put it at your desk, whatever it takes. It is not about success. God has never called us to success. You will not get in front of Jesus someday. And he says, well done, good and successful servant. Doesn't happen. He takes care of all that. Well done, good and faithful servant. Doesn't matter what those circumstances are. If you hold on to him in faith, it leads to fruitfulness. And the next one, I think the last one. The end is not always what we want, but faithfulness leads to kingdom building. I'm sure Paul would have had, I mean, and Paul says it. He wants to go to Rome and he wants to teach in the streets. Because if you can lead Rome to Christ, the center city, that's over all the rest of the world, then you get the rest of the world. That was his plan. Never happened. But he testified to Caesar. He testified to his guards. When we go through, this is who he testified through, through, through the Roman, the Rome. Jerusalem, James, the apostles, Jews, Gentiles, Centurion guards, Caesarea, the council, the tribune, Paul's family, Felix, Festus, King Agrippa, Queen Agrippa's wife, who was Jewish, by the way, the entire ship, the jealous and the prisoners, the residents in Malta, the Church of Rome, Rome itself, jailers, and Caesar was what the kingdom building was for him to go through a hard road. Is that enough to go through a hard road? So, from the standpoint, now that you've sat through all that, my prayer is that the Spirit is speaking to you individually. A lot of these have been as individuals in the church, but this one I really think he's reaching out to us individually and saying, I've got a message for you, son. I've got a message for you, daughter. 
I know it's hard, but the hard road is worth it if you're following me, and I've got you. And these are ways that I will sustain you. It's not just surviving through it. This is the opportunities I'm going to give you. This is the stuff I'm going to protect you from. A snake can come up and bite your hand, and it don't even matter. It's going to hurt, but the sting of death is no longer there. When we had the worship so, uh, service last Sunday night, and if you didn't get it come, we did uh, release it yesterday or the day before, the video version. Still not the same. It's just like church. It's, it's not the same when you're not in the room, but it's still awesome. And you'll notice that uh, a lot of them were wearing, well, everybody was uh, pretty much wearing the shirt, Jesus won. Mike's wearing it today. I think Emily has one on. Um, and I love that phrasing because it's not Jesus wins. Because if you hold on to Jesus wins, there's almost a thought that, okay, Jesus wins some, Satan wins some, uh, da, da. Jesus is one. It's done. It's a one and done. Everything else is just leaning into him. Last story I'll share with you. This is Second Kings 6, if you want to write it down. I did put a new version for you if you want it. But when I'm talking about community, it's not just about Christian community physically, but spiritually. Second Kings 6, we have a situation where the prophet Elijah is um, it's having a bad day, and he and his servant have an army come against him. This other nation wants Elijah dead, so they're coming down the hill, and uh, the, the servant is... I, I'm, I'm pretty confident, if my, I might be misquoting some, but I'm pretty sure he looked at Elijah and says, I'm pooping my pants. This entire army is coming against them, and he is terrified. And Elijah goes, don't, don't worry. He's like, oh, sure, that makes sense. Thanks, man. Ship's falling apart. The army's coming against us. And he says, God, show him what I see. Open his eyes. And God opens the servant's eyes. Do you know this one? It sees all these chariots and all these, uh, this army of angels surrounding the entire valley that that other army can't see. That they're, they're completely overpowered. And the servant says, I think I'm okay. Need some new doors, but I think I'm okay. Right? Then Elijah says, God, make him blind. And God says, okay. And the entire army is blinded. And then Elijah walks up to the army. I love the Bible. He goes up to him, honest testimony. And says, look, I'm not the man you're looking for, but I'll, I'll lead you the way. What are they going to do? They're blind. They, they're freaking out. So he leads them to, they think, Elijah. And he leads them right smack in the middle of Samaria, which is the enemy of these people, which are people that are, love the prophet Elijah. And their army is much more massive than what they sent against Elijah. And he takes them right into the middle of town, and everybody comes out, and they surround them and look at them. And Elijah says, oh, God, can you let them see again? And they get to see an army, a physical army. And the king says, should we kill them for them? We'll, we'll, we'll take them out, prophet. You, you tell us. They're dead. And he goes, no, let's make, let's make them a banquet. That's crazy. I love <laughs> Anyways, by the way, the book study for Don't Let the Enemy at Your Banquet Table starts next week. Anyways, uh, so they make him a banquet. They well feed him, and then they say, go home and tell your king about this. Even in your worst moments when you feel completely alone. And Satan will usually be the one to get you there because he'll get you to the point that you just don't want to be around people, which is what you need. So you're sitting at home, depressed, watching Netflix, whatever. I pray that God opens your eyes and you can see what he's doing for you and what he has around you and what goes before you so that we can get through these hard roads for the kingdom of God.